Jonathan. It's nice to have a fan. <clears throat> um, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to give uh, the talk. I'm honored uh, that you think I'm versatile and interesting enough to be qualified to speak on such a subject. Now, um, I want to start out by saying I'm here because you might say I made a mistake. And mom, if you're watching the video on the internet or something, I want to apologize for this. I majored in art history. If you want to know why I think this is a mistake, Google the term worst majors. And I, I did this this morning. Now you will find that when it even makes the list, that art history is one of those things that is loads of fun while you're doing it. Maybe. It's actually harder than you think. <clears throat> Uh, but you have a decidedly low chance of getting a job in it, and even if you do get a job in it, your pay is going to be absurdly low. So it's worst major for employment, uh, salary, and probably overall satisfaction. Nevertheless, I didn't go in it for the money, um, nor for the fame or power or you know women that I thought would come with it. <coughs> um, not only did I major in art history, Having switched to it from a major which might have gotten me places in life, which was uh, international relations, uh, I went on to do a PhD in art history, making the even bigger mistake of going even more narrow. So I have a PhD in Islamic art history. And I know more than anyone else in the world about a small group of about five Iranian manuscripts from the first half of the 16th century. So anyone who's turning green with jealousy, uh, thank you. So you would think that this was a pretty ridiculous uh, course, and I thought I would get away with it, because, you know, when you're young, you think, oh, I'm so smart, and I went to a good school, and fall on, feel on, feel on. Well, I, uh, I kind of, I did manage for a while, but uh, things sort of broke down, and uh, I came to Turkey uh, for love, because my wife is uh, Turkish and teaches here. <coughs> um, I found myself kind of cast off. Now, since the time I've been in Istanbul, I have managed to find work, pay for my, you know, self and my family um, by doing things like, some of you may know me as your humanities teacher. Some of you may know me as your aesthetics teacher, perhaps as your Persian and or Arabic teacher. I have also taught history of civilizations uh, major works of Eastern art, and SAT prep, including writing coaching. So, if you want to consider this versatile, that is indeed how I have survived. But uh, it puts me in mind of some lessons that we can draw uh, about life from life. And there's a particular life form that we see on the Boazici campus a lot, which I think we can learn from. Oh, actually not that one, but maybe, maybe metaphorically. I mean, I mean these. These are, of course, the cats of Boazich University, who have undoubtedly a much better life than the students at Boazich University. Because think about it. What's it like to be a cat at Boazich? You know, people feed you. I mean, literally, I see cats gathered around giant piles of kibble. Um, my own department in the uh, photocopy room, we have a photocopier, about four file cabinets, and uh, 330 pounds of cat food. So, they get respect, okay? <clears throat> now, also, think about the life of a cat more generally, okay? What does a cat do? Well, you know, wakes up in the morning, he, if he's hungry, he goes and finds something to eat. If the sun is shining, he suns himself. If he sees a mouse, he chases it. You'll hear them yowling at each other because they're fighting over territory, okay? And all these things. All these things, including uh, scratching yourself, all these things actually add up, okay? This cat looks all, you know, carefully and so forth. This cat, ladies and gentlemen, is a cat on a mission, right? This cat has a sacred quest, a purpose, and that is to be a cat. <laughs> That's what its life is about, okay? Its life is about fulfilling the sort of potentialities that being a cat fulfills, whether they are resting in the sun or feasting on a mouse or enjoying a head scratch from someone like me, okay? All these things 
come automatically to it. Okay? A cat's values are automatic, they're inbuilt. You'll never see a cat wondering what to do next. Okay? You know, this is not the face of self-doubt. Okay? Cat's values are all integrated towards one end. And actually, if you dig deeper, it's not just their sort of personae, it's their very organism. Everything about them, okay? The way they breathe, the way they digest food, the tail for balance, the claws, and so forth, all of it is automatically all pointing towards one goal, which is life as a cat, fulfilling its nature in the universe. So, we can envy them for this, after a fashion. Right? Because it brings me to another thing that we see on the Boazji campus, and that's us. Okay? Me, you, human beings, students. Okay? All of these people are out you know, enjoying a fine day, taking a break from all the you know, terrible learning that they have to do. Now, we have things in common with cats, obviously. Okay? You know, we digest food, we walk, we uh, yowl at each other over territory. Uh, we do all these things as living organisms, but there's a crucial difference between us and the cats. And that is, with us, it's just not automatic. Moreover, think about a cat's horizons. What you see a cat doing all day is pretty much what the cat's going to be doing all day, okay? And for the rest of its life, they have a very limited span of possible experiences. Okay? This is one reason they're happy all the time, right? Because they don't have to worry about, you know, oh, am I going to get fired? Because who's going to fire a cat? Okay? <clears throat> but to them it comes automatically, to us it doesn't, okay? Ask any baby, you know? As you grow, you know, human beings have the longest period of dependency of anything in the biological world, for, by far. And that's because we have to grow and learn about life and what it is to be what we are and can be. Okay? I talk about a cat's horizons being limited. Our horizons are, what are they? Infinite. I mean, think of all the things people are, things that they can be, the things that they have been. I mean, you're at a university. You're in the best possible place to think about this. No matter what your major, you're building on the achievements of people before you who have looked at the world, who have thought, who have created, built, invented, achieved. And, you know, looking at this from the Hubble Space Telescope or whatever, that in itself is an achievement. And, you know, someday we'll go there. <clears throat> So all these things are what, it is, what is possible to a human being. So we have infinite possibilities and a complete lack of automatic knowledge of how to get there. Okay? We sit on an infinite potential, and actualizing it is anybody's guess. I mean, we didn't come with an instruction book. We have to figure it out ourselves using our reason. Okay? <clears throat> now... Other problem is, when we do come to learn about it, we're fallible, right? We make mistakes. Cats do not make mistakes. I mean, they can have accidents, you know, get stuck in a tree. Uh, they can run out into the road and get hit by a car, eat the wrong food. You know, if its knowledge fails, it has problems and can even die. But they're not fallible in the sense that they can screw up the way we can. Okay, you know, speaking from experience as one who has done so many times. Right, now, we have a life to live for ourselves, okay? And survival, to me, does not just mean staying out of the grave, because that's where we're all going to end up anyway. Survival doesn't just mean fending off death for another day or week or month. Survival means full flourishing with all your human capacities, right? So how are we going to do this, right? You especially. I mean, you're young. I'm old, okay? You all are young. You know, you're at the beginning. You have youth and energy and you know, a future, you got to think about where all this energy is going to go, right? You can't scatter it. This is no way to live, okay? It's no way to achieve anything in life. If you want to build a house, you don't just go, well, I'll just do whatever I feel like doing next, you know? Eh, put some wood over here, you know, put some stones over here. I mean, that's, that's no way to do anything. Not build a house, not raise crops, not, uh, you know, proceed in science, not anything like this. You have to plan and direct your energies appropriately. And this is where it's interesting to think about the original meaning of the term versatile, okay, versatility. 
when the word sort of arose in the English language, it had a bad meaning. Okay? It meant changeable, inconstant, fickle. Okay? It comes from the Latin word to turn, and versatile means turning a lot. Okay? So versatile actually meant a negative thing. And if you look at it this way, then it is a negative thing. If you're constantly throwing your energies into unrelated directions, as you were arguing so well that school makes you do, at least as constituted presently, okay, this is no way to live a life. Okay? You may survive in the sense of, well, I can do this a little bit, so I'll get an entry-level job doing it. Okay? And then I get fired, so, well, I know a little bit about this other thing, so I'll get an entry-level job doing that and get fired. You know, you can bounce around on one level for a while, but that's no way to live, it's no way to proceed in life. Okay. What you need in life is a unifying purpose. Okay. Think back to the cats, or now move on to yourself if you want. Your body, your organism, everything about it, just like I was saying with the cats, is geared towards one thing and that's keeping you alive. Okay. Your breathing, your heartbeat, your immune system, your regulation of temperature, your perceptual apparatus, I mean, all of the, the stuff you, you come with when you're born has the purpose of living life. Now, what you need to do as human beings is add to that your own conscious capacity to think and act upon that action by giving yourself a central purpose, this mission. The cat's mission is easy. Your mission is up to you. Now, that's our curse and our blessing, right? Now, you know, if I can... Uh, be permitted a return to my own autobiography. This is how I went at it, okay? Now, I, I joke about my graduating as an art history major, but it was serious, okay? When I was just about your age, I realized that I didn't like the course I had set for myself. Right? I, I went into college thinking, well, you know, I'm interested in, like, world news and stuff like that, so I'll study international relations, okay? With a vague dream of, like, um, working for the State Department or something. But then, purely by happenstance, I discovered the, con the, the concept of the, the major of art history. I mean, literally, just by flipping through the course catalog. And I was gripped. Okay? And I thought, this sounds really interesting. And it took me a short time, I mean, the course of a few weeks, to realize that this was what I wanted everything in me to be about. This was the core around which I wanted to wrap everything I did. I wanted to understand our capacity as human beings to experience and appreciate and value and create beauty and beautiful things. And so everything I did after that had to be related to that central purpose. Okay? Now, it turns out that you can sort of have a lot of little flowers grow from this particular trunk. Okay? For example, okay, I studied a lot of art. Fine, that's what an art historian does. But I also had to study a lot of history. If you're going to understand people, human beings, human nature, you've got to understand what they've done or not done and how it's worked out for them. I studied a lot of philosophy because that's what aesthetics is. Okay? It's a philosophical understanding of art, not just who painted what when and you know, who was he influenced by and all that stuff. Okay? I had to pick up a lot of languages. If you're going to penetrate a civilization, you need to know how they thought, and the best way into that is to see it expressed naively, in, in the sense of not through somebody else's translation. Okay? <clears throat> also, why did I go into Islamic art? Well, precisely because, not because I wanted to be diverse or anything like this, or God forbid, multicultural. It's because I wanted to understand art as a universal, pan-human phenomenon. And if I stick to like Italian Renaissance painting, or whatever, I would feel stuck in a very limited niche. So I wanted the broad view. Plus, I like the Arabic alphabet. It's really cool. <clears throat> okay, now, you know, as occasion arose, sometimes I had to find, you know, ways to pay the bills. Uh, at one point during a, a little hiatus from my studies, I went out and I learned uh, what was back then very easy, which was uh, computer graphics and web design. Okay? Because graphic design has all these aesthetic elements put to a very practical end. Okay? Now, as it happens, that got me my first job. Because when I graduated with my PhD, and guess what? Nobody wanted to hire me. 
voila, I came east and I worked in uh, Cyprus for a year teaching graphic design. I mean, who would have thought it? From there, I moved to a museum job in London and then back to Istanbul, as I say, for love, where my skill set paid off. Okay? I can get these jobs, I can do these jobs and do them well, mind you, because I intentionally wrapped them all around a central purpose. I did not set out to become versatile. I did not wake up one morning when I was 19 or whatever and say, you know, I want to do everything. You know, I want to master like marine biology and chess and karate and uh, electric guitar and uh, nuclear chemistry. You know, making this list, show me somebody who does that and I'll show you somebody who's not versatile. That person is an unfulfilled flake. <clears throat> so, by way of conclusion, I just want to say that as versatile as I am, if you want to call it versatile, it happened, be it happened organically, is what I'm trying to say. It, it arose out of a process that I think is the right way to go about living a thriving, fully potentialized human life, and that's to have one mission, one purpose, which is broad enough to admit all sorts of interests, and they will flower like uh, flowers on a branch, and branches from a trunk, but it's all interconnected, it's all s mutually self-supporting, and it has worked for me, and I hope that as you proceed in life with whatever major you're studying, that you too land on your feet. Thank you for having me.